in the fight against COVID-19. There's quite a lot of stuff beginning to happen. Just beginning. Quite exciting times. It's awesome. And we all believe that this technology can have a, a difference in in our new COVID uh, acceptance world or COVID dealing world. Uh, uh, yeah. Ken, if you can get and thank you for sharing, Pete. Ken, all good. If you could uh, do an introduction on yourself for the group as well. Sure. Thanks, Frank. Um, <laughs> this is Ken Allgood, founder and CEO of HealthFlow and Resilience Labs. Uh, we, uh, Resilience Labs side, we, it's a consulting firm. We work with DOD and VA Health, specifically uh, supporting NLP, machine learning, and uh, blockchain pilots. We've done a couple specifically with the DOD VA from a health exchange perspective well, uh, last year and this year. Um, HealthFlow is a health exchange and patient-centric health data delivery platform that we're in the process of building right now and um, hope to have at least some initial pilots starting beginning of next calendar year. Awesome, thank you very much for sharing. And uh, we will get started then. Uh, before we get into our uh, agenda, we have to uh, be aware of the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. Uh, pretty much this is a summary that explains do not disclose anything you wouldn't want to be uh, addressed into the public, any trade secrets, any, uh, any, any individual company secrets that may, uh, that may hold you liable in the future. Do not share them, disclose them. This is an open forum, uh, please. Uh, and, and any IP concerns you may have with other partners or or uh, or companies that are, that are in your ecosystem or network, do not disclose them. Be kind to each other, and also um, to have open thoughts and opinions for this forum. So, so thank you very much for adhering to that. Um, now, I want to get two things out of the way to kind of showcase everything to everyone. Uh, for everything blockchain and healthcare news, to get a weekly write-up on what is going on in the world of blockchain healthcare today, I highly encourage you to check out Robert Miller's uh, uh, Substack account, as every Sunday and Monday he releases uh, new information for the blockchain healthcare world on what is going on in industry. Yeah. I'm going to put yeah. that in the chat right here for everyone to reference to if you're not already subscribed. Oh, and Marta, Marta's with us as well, but I'll, I'll get to her in one second uh, so she'll introduce herself personally as well. I also encourage everyone to be able to check out uh, Ray Dagum's Health Unchained podcast, which uh, usually every week or week and a half, he has, he has a new guest on that as of in, that is related to industry that is able to describe a new perspective through a podcast format. Uh, most recently, he had Leah Houston from HPEC, which is looking to create a, uh, a self-sovereign uh, physician network that is based on blockchain technology as well. In prior episodes, he's had uh, many different guests, including uh, people from my company, Consensus Health and others. So I highly suggest that everyone uh, takes a look at his podcast as well. I'll put that in the chat too. And you can be able to reference that as well. I also then would like to introduce two new members that are very good. They're going to be associated with the healthcare special interest group. And first, I want to give attention. I don't have it on the uh, direct uh, agenda here, but I would like to introduce you, introduce you to Marta, who is part of the Hyperledger ecosystem team. And she's now going to be our ecosystem lead as David Boswell has spent uh, the past two years with, with Rich Block and others to help guide us and connect us to industry yeah. and, and partners. And so Marta, if you could give a, an introduction to yourself, to the group, and uh, tell everyone a little bit about you. Thank you for, <clears throat> for, for, for inviting me and welcoming me in, uh, in the group. I've been working with Hyperledger for four years now, and um, I've been working with uh, other special interest groups. In fact, I actually helped setting up a special interest group uh, just as I started my work with Hyperledger. Um, however, uh, after a year or so, David Boswell took over um, and helped, you know, kind of uh, get the group up and running. Uh, I am currently coordinating work with the public sector and supply chain special interest groups. So this will be my third one. Uh, on day-to-day -day basis, I um, 
and lead the system team on our members and member engagement and also I run the academic program so trying to connect with different universities so I'm happy to um, you know talk more about what I do if you have any questions you can always email me at marta at linuxfoundation.org and I just hope to be uh, um, a, a resource for this group to um, help you with anything to do with hyperledger. All right, thank you very much for that. And now we'll move on as we now have a, a member of the Hyperledger Special Interest Group that is looking to take on as the use case development lead, and that is John Hatchell. Uh, John, if you could give a proper introduction to yourself uh, and, and describe what are some of the action items and missions you hope to accomplish within the use case development group. So, so please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is John Hatchell. Uh, I, uh, I've got a pretty diverse background in healthcare. Um, I have about 15 years uh, in leadership in the medical device space, uh, and then just recently moved over uh, into a risk management consulting firm beginning of the year, uh, where uh, we, we help create, uh, you know, risk management uh, programs uh, through consulting and through, through brokership for, uh, for, for healthcare entities and such as hospitals, uh, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, you name it, uh, all the way down to as granular as digital health and telehealth organizations. So, so that takes about the bulk of my time. Um, uh, I also uh, represent, uh, through my, through through my broker license, uh, a company called Evertos, which is the, the only commercial uh, blockchain uh, insurance carrier that exists at this point. Um, so uh, that, that's been, been exciting and, and, and give, opened me up to, to, to a whole other world to, uh, of you know, how, how to manage the risk in, in, in all these organizations. Uh, and then for when uh, Mike approached me about this group, uh, it was exciting for me uh, because I'm currently engaged in my own startup project right now currently. Um, where again, you know, I've done a lot of the research necessary in, in, in trying to figure out, you know, uh, you know, what, what, what's a great, you know, a great concept to, 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 to try to prove and, and, and tr try to provide proof of value on. And, uh, and we're, we're currently working towards, uh, uh, developing a minimally viable product for, for a pilot here, um, at the end of the year. So, um, it, you know, with, with this talking to Erica, um, who, uh, was involved with this group prior, it looks like this, it just needs a little bit of a jump start. Um, and, uh, I know that the areas of focus currently are, uh, pharmaceutical supply chain processing, medical records, uh, credentialing, uh, and insurance payer management. So it, my hope is to try to engage with, with folks that are on the call today and others that may not. Um, maybe folks that, that, that you may know that are, that are in the community or have interest in being part of the community. I think this is a great place uh, to, to start uh, if, if, if there's people who are interested in, in, in furthering their understanding uh, of, of, the, of this great technology. Um, you know, I, I think the way that I, I, I hope to, to lead uh, this group as, as we move forward is, is early on and, and probably will get, will kick off in the next, uh, next couple of weeks here. Um, first, just by exploring uh, successful use cases and, and startups and, and organizations that have, have deployed uh, uh, novel use cases of, uh, uh, of this technology in healthcare. Um, and then move on from there with uh, a little bit of group thinking and, and, and group thought of, 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 of new use case ideas that, that we can explore. And then from there, starting to just to, to build uh, upon an, an overall use case and, and for, for development. And uh, I, I would, the goal would be is over a 12 month period uh, to try to, to come up with, uh, with a possible test for, for proof of concept and, and possibly even pursue uh, some sort of uh, MVP if, if we uh, if we have the capabilities to do it. So um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that again it's it, it, we we can try to drive some engagement to this group. Um, and again, I, I would encourage folks to uh, to to try to advocate for for participation either by, if yourself if you're if you're if you're available um, or, or or folks that you know within within the uh, the community who may have some interest. Um, and, and being involved because again um, we're, we're only going to be as good as the people who, who lend themselves to it and uh, again diversity of thought is the key to really progressing this movement forward. 
Thank you very much, John. That is a great overview. And what we're going to be working on with the use case development group as well as creating frameworks and uh, value creation templates in place that could be able to show things like data reconciliation, uh, manual reconciliation, uh, access to consent management and tools and information related to healthcare records, et cetera. So um, we will be looking to over time, hopefully create a framework that all people that want to use any type of DLT solution, whether Hyperledger or not, could, be benef could benefit through this type of framework. So it's gonna be uh, an exciting phase. Uh, I also have some uh, great news to, under to announce that Al Farrington, who was on the last special interest group meeting, is looking to help us out with Confluence and to make our, our Confluence website a little bit more uh, modern and to be able to, <laughs> to make it better, frankly, because I'm not the Confluence expert, so we will be, uh, We'll be utilizing him to help uh, help out with the website, and so, and I also want to be able to announce two different events that are coming up uh, for us. For one, on uh, November fourth, which is the Wednesday after the U.S. presidential election, uh, I'm luckily hosting an event with IEEE specifically within their blockchain and AI working groups, uh, which is our industry day. Within the industry day, we have a, a great program that's gonna be able to uh, showcase uh, some people of, uh, of relevance in industry. For one, we have, uh, we have Drummond Reed from Evernim, which is going, he's, uh, Evernim is a, a company that's creating digital identity standards that are connecting into decentralized IDs, also within the Web 3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, and, and, and connecting into, um, a lot of standards bodies that are associated with digital identity. As we all know, digital identity is very important for blockchain and being able to identify who's accessing networks and private networks, et cetera. And uh, he'll be able to describe how this is gonna be beneficial for medical devices. We even have uh, one of the IEEE working groups within the medical imaging uh, sector that are going to demonstrate their product of, uh, sorry, I can't really see this overview because of the, the sidebar of everyone's thumbnail, but uh, they have been able to create a 3D topological mapping solution uh, that uses uh, in big data. It's using just many different data sources to be able to create an augmented intelligence mechanism that could be able to predict how bio biomedical data imaging files will be able to either grow or, or how specific diseases and ailments may be attributed to specific demographics. And it should be an interesting workshop as I'm not a medical imaging expert, but I'm going to learn a lot for that. We also then have our, our friend Ben Taylor, who is going to uh, present on Bruin Chain and how Bruin Chain has been a drug supply chain solution and platform for those that are sending pharmaceuticals especially for emergency use author authorization that is uh, addressed by uh, the FDA and for COVID-19. So it should be a, a great presentation there. We also have Suzanne Somerville, who is from Chronicled, who works on the MetaLedger project. MetaLedger is a project that uh, uses blockchain to help for chargebacks and uh, and just data reconciliation within healthcare in the life science industry. And uh, she'll she always gives a very motivating talk on how blockchain can enable the future, especially in relation to medical devices. This whole conference is focused on blockchain AI for medical devices. We then have Susan Ramanat from Spiritus and Mitch Parker, who is the CIO of Indiana University Health, which will showcase the software build materials pilot. We then have Kitty Cold Colding, who will be uh, showcasing her AI-based platform that showcases how uh, respiratory devices, system symptoms should be on there, are actually being able to surveil and help mitigate against predictive risk for uh, respiratory symptoms, which would be valuable for COVID-19 as well. And we also have Brian Anderson, who is one of the directors at MITRE, which is a nonprofit uh, organization that really helps out in government, uh, government projects, as well as working with healthcare and medical companies, or, Oh, sorry, healthcare systems in the United States. Uh, Brian's going to give a, an example of his clinical data analytics platform, which uses aspects of federated learning. Federated learning is uh, creating a data analytical or a machine learning model 
uh, between multiple participants in a network that is protected by cryptography so you don't actually have to see the original message or, de message or details of that data but still are able to find the insights overall and uh, they've, co they've combined some very very uh, high level uh, health data together to help understand uh, patient data in regards to COVID-19 in the Fight Is In Us campaign. And I'm excited for that. And then John Greaves and Jim St. Clair are going to conclude us for the, the day. So I'm off my soapbox on that. That program is going to be great. I also want to uh, let everyone know that on our next session, sorry, not our next session, two sessions from now on November 25th, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we will have Ledger Domain present their new updated platform, uh, their blockchain for pharmaceutical supply chain platform, and uh, and how they're specifically using this for uh, pharmaceutical companies to verify uh, pharmaceuticals and other devices in the fight against COVID-19. So I'm excited for those presentations coming up. Any questions on those so far? For any details. Wait, uh, Mike, when are they, and are, are you going to send this an information to join? Yeah, it's going to be part of the general meeting on 11:25 for Ledger Domain, and then uh, for the program, uh, you can be able to register for the IEEE event here through this. Uh, it's, it looks so awful that thumbnail, <laughs> but um, but hey, that's what we got. So this is how you can be able to join for the IEEE event. And for Ledger Domain, you will just use the Zoom link we do to join these meetings, and that'll be on 11:25. So, just for all, you all to be aware. And also, this is our uh, general meeting link here today, so you can be able to see the agendas in real time rather than me just sharing my screen as well. So, is that good enough information? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Any other questions about those updates and, and new happenings within the healthcare special interest group? Awesome. I, we also, as a, a healthcare special interest group, the subgroup leads were not able to make uh, their meetings today, but Denise, Ravish, Stephen, myself, Erica, and John are meeting on Friday uh, at four o'clock Eastern time to be able to uh, ideate on how we could have better communication between the subgroups and the special interest group to keep you all updated on the projects and the developments that are going on within the subgroups. So we are trying to, uh, to be a little bit more uh, active than we were in the past. So before we get into, uh, I want to be able to go into the, a couple research papers that I found somewhat interesting uh, in, within the healthcare life science world, but I wanted to share with you all uh, a great opportunity that came from the Department of Commerce uh, through my avenues this week. Uh, they are actually looking to, or sorry, this is the global giving one. I wanna show you the Department of Commerce one first. So the U.S. Department of Commerce is launching a $25 million sprint challenge to address COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic thought entrepreneurship. Through this, they'll be giving grants uh, to how many companies? At least $500,000 over a 12-month period. And uh, if you are able to meet the standards and criteria that are given by the Department of Commerce, you could also win up to $750,000 as well. Uh, this could be an interesting sprint challenge for some of the, the things you and your uh, teams are looking to provide. So I highly suggest you sign up for this link, especially if you're part of the United States. If not, uh, you could be outside of the United States and still benefit our US government if you want to be able to accept their money. So uh, that is the link to be able to access that as well. Um, but there's also uh, a new list for uh, COVID-19 grants and nonprofits for small businesses. For those that are in startup environments, uh, you can be able to uh, head to this website to check out all these different philanthropic and uh, other opportunities that can be relevant for you. So uh, I want to make that aware for you that are looking for money to raise your projects and it can be very beneficial. Any questions on these two resources that I found? All right, awesome. So uh, let's go into some paper reviews and then we'll kind of go into an open forum.
So uh, a couple of papers I thought that were relevant. One, I found uh, from IEEE in the Future Directions uh, uh, Working Group, an article that states about how IEEE and, and social, there's a lot of social implications of emerging technologies that are gonna be relevant to the future pandemic uh, or the, the pandemic that is going on right now. Here is the overall link for that article. It includes aspects of big data, blockchain, 5G, and drones. Uh, the, the overview I really got from this is that blockchain is going to help with contact tracing and surveillance, but there are a lot of uh, aspects of if you're using blockchain to store information on it forever, that that hash and that data uh, may not be as relevant when you have to keep on, when you have to continuously change a health record, uh, which is kind of basic stuff we're all, all aware of. But um, they also go over how uh, telecommunications and some uh, networking companies will have to uh, somewhat be governing bodies in, in order to distribute access to this information. And that, you know, typical uh, digitizing and getting people used to digitization and applications and mobile phones and desktop browser servers are going to be a problem that's going to come uh, as, as the years go on. But uh, interesting article, definitely something for us to be aware of. And uh, also about how the chain supply chain, how drones may be and autonomous vehicles may not be uh, driven by actual humans, yet they'll be able to transport devices. Uh, nothing that's like earth shattering there. But, uh, and this is the section that's found with connecting the unconnected. It's really interesting. The, the more I think about blockchain technology and anyone, please, speak up if, if any of these type of topics are, are relevant to you. The more I, I, I get involved with blockchain technology, the more I realize that uh, it's very relevant for people that are in high populated groups in cities and metropolitan areas. Whereas in rural situations and in, in rural communities uh, where there's less people you have to trust, or sorry, there's less people you inter interact with. So in hindsight, you trust them more. Blockchain is not as relevant unless you were using blockchain for supplies and, and many materials and for farming, uh, you know, it, it's just different needs. And, and I just find that kind of interesting as of late. Uh, anyone else, if, if you have thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, Mike, I'd like to weigh in on that. It's Leah. Um, sure. I was speaking to a group out of India the other day that they sort of needed help with their medical projects. So I've given, I'm giving them a bit of um, assistance. But they brought up a really interesting use case around rural medical help and that patients have to pay for their medications each time they see a doctor. And so this is quite common in the rural parts where they're not funded by governments or by insurance companies in terms of their health cover. And I thought it was a really interesting case in terms of centralising that information so that patients can share them uh, with their different healthcare stakeholders. So that's just something that I wanted to bring to, to light here where, you know, I'm sort of, I think in different healthcare systems, we're used to, I guess, either hospitals or healthcare facilities having our information available or being able to access that information. In this case, patients are sort of having to pay for their information and they, then they're having to get duplicate tests done. So for example, whether it be radiology or pathology, they're getting sort of compromised on that and disadvantaged on that. So I think blockchain has a real part in rural communities for sharing information as well. So I just wanted to add that in and maybe get people's feedback on that if there's any. And sorry for the background noise. No worries. Any feedback or, or any uh, additional comments on that? All right, well, please check out that article to, to give it a read. There also was this article I found on PubMed to discuss blockchain technology opportunities for solving real world plot problems in healthcare and biomedical science. Uh, this is a longer read and, and kind of incorporates many different aspects of uh, secure patient IDs, which is a topic I'm very uh, interested in and, and looking to kind of, uh, kind of build on a lot more. So I highly encourage you all to take this literature uh, separately and see if it's relevant to you and your practices. There's a lot of, and I bring this up 
I feel like every week, but there's so many semantic uh, representation problems when it comes to patient identification, as well as when you're thinking of storing healthcare information, typically your health information is never inputted by you yourself. You usually need a physician or someone that is a, a trained medical and, and credentialed professional that is really writing your physical history of yourself. And we don't have many attempts for us to write down the details associated to our own body to express itself. We usually need a third party. And, and yes, I think aspects of, aspects of telemedicine or telehealth and telehealth services and video being able to diagnose and, and kind of understand how and why our body is working is useful but it's also hurting that credential and, and, and trusting the information that, that physicians are able to uh, see from us, right? Because there's only so much you can see in a video, there's only so many things you can understand. And uh, I'm kind of interested in, in hearing from other people's opinion on whether they believe these emerging, or not emerging, but that technology and remote capabilities and, and, and creating incentives for people to report their own you know, details of their biome and their body could be relevant. I'd love to hear people's thoughts on, on that type of topic. Mike, I can, I can share some thoughts just because um, I, I consult a number of digital health and telehealth organizations. So I, I've got probably a, 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 a little bit more information than, than most, most uh, consumers in, in, in the market. So, you know, one, one of the things um, that is probably necessary, I guess, to make uh, the, the data more substantial is, and, and this is kind of a, it's a little bit of a sidebar, but it's, it's remote patient monitoring and, and, and those type of devices necessary to, to, to ensure the accuracy uh, of, of a lot of the information that's being input, right? Because that's, it's, at the end of the day, it's, you know, we, we, in healthcare, especially those involved in patient care, you'll hear the term garbage in, garbage out quite a bit which is, you know, if, if it's bad data going in, right, you know, bad, bad things come on the back end, right? So um, that's, that's been a, a, a challenge, I think, for a lot of people um, involved in direct patient care right now is that, you know, when you, when you have a lot of self-reporting going on, the problem is, is that patients aren't exactly that forthcoming as you would hope, right? And, and so um, that's why I think the advancement of technology around wearables, um, you know, there's there's a million and one technologies that are in development right now related to, to, to RPM that uh, that, that are going to be crucial. Um, so so I think blockchain can be a facilitator of that data um, and almost like uh, you know help, helping the, you know create some transparency between that you know that, that physician patient relationship which is necessary in the whole uh, you know health healthcare 3.0 concept that everyone's trying to get to. Um, but there is going to be, a, there's going to be uh, necessary, it's going to be necessary for, for uh, some other technologies to kind of get uh, themselves into the fold uh, to ensure that the delivery of care is adequate to, to what, what, what patients are used to receiving today. Any other thoughts on that from anyone else? I know it's early for some of you, but, but please, yeah. any, any uh, uh, No, I would just, I would piggyback on that. Um, that you're absolutely correct. Uh, the specifically devices being able to pull that data into the overall record, using the blockchain from a trust perspective to be able to provide that, that information, the metadata around the provenance is really going to be a critical piece moving forward. And again, that's how, that's actually how we're leveraging blockchain and health flow is not to store the health data, but to store the transaction information. And specifically, whenever we're talking about um, external, whether it's external devices, whether it's uh, home monitoring solutions, whether it's uh, di diabetes data um, coming from devices that are either inserted under the skin or are, you know, the data is actually just being input. Um, uh, even prescription inputs, uh, whether or not you've taken your pills, those sorts of things, all of that data can actually then be absorbed and taken into the overall health record from a data feed perspective. And again, the, the blockchain, even though it's coming from the consumer, 
um, it adds an additional level of trust for the clinician to then take that in and uh, have, use that consumer provided data, even though it's coming from devices and things, it's coming from the house, it's outside of the, the practice engagement. I, we now can provide some level of authority, some level of trust, and more importantly, an actual re transaction record that shows when it was collected, when it was aggregated, when it was sent. So, yeah, I mean, th those are the types of use cases that are more applicable and certainly easier to get into practice, get in incorporated, because it's more of a supply chain implementation, really. Um, it's just, it's, it's patient data, but it's still, it's supply chain. And it's not data that's so sensitive, like health data, um, that uh, it, it checks all those, you know, warning clacks and alarms going off. And you're also not updating it continuously, to your point, Mike. Um, that's also why we're not using the blockchain for your health record. It, it's also interesting, too, that uh, I've always thought in the, you know, the supply chain aspect of this, for people that are doing pupil transportation, when I mentioned pupil transportation, those are the uh, those are the caregivers and the um, patient or assisted home living facility uh, folks that are transporting either seniors or people that can't walk on their own or can't don't have that have mobility issues. How do you know that someone is you know it's bringing a van to you or your your loved one's home? is actually who they say they are. And then they're taking you someone, you're trusting this third party service that they're gonna be able to take you, keep you safe, make sure you're going to the right place. Because in other countries, maybe not in the United States, it's a huge issue, but I have heard and read of issues like that in India and in other parts of the world where there's fraudulent, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the term of uh, assisted living facility uh, caretakers that are, uh, that are doing this, right? And, and blockchain can be a way to verify that credential Right? not storing the actual credential, but being a transaction gateway to help, uh, to help ensure that each person is showing multiple credentials, whether they're, digi they're digital ones or physical ones, to verify that the attestation of who they actually are. And there was a conference this past week, or last week, called IIW, which is about identity. It was just a big identity conference. And uh, some people from the Uport team, Uport's a team out of Consensus AG, the parent company that I'm a part of, that are looking to uh, create an automatically verified or computationally verified way to uh, attest to the digital identity as they're signing on from either a mobile device, but then also attesting to a, 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 a database or server that goes back and verifies their physical identity, whether it's a driver's license or it's actually their, their, um, their credentials from the hospital, it's who they say they are. So not only does it verify supply chains and actual physical items, but it help, helps uh, verify who people are when they're working in transit as well. And I'm very interested in, in trying to solve the identity problems that help uh, bridge people to work in healthcare environments too. Ravish, oh, Ravish has joined us. Thank you, thank you for, uh, for coming on. Ravish, if you could uh, give kind of a, and sorry, uh, we'll pause my thought there, but Ravish, could you give an update uh, from the uh, the payer subgroup and, and everything you guys are all yeah. working on? So, um, Mike, I apologize. My, I have a regular conflict at this time. Uh, I'm trying to move that conflict so I can start attending, um, you know, from, from next meeting. I was able to cut short that one and, and quickly jump on this one. So I apologize for being late. Um, hopefully I will be able to join on time starting next uh, meeting. But just a quick update on from pair subgroup. Um, we started working on the POC for the modernization for prescription management. Um, and um, uh, we, we are at a point wherein we have, uh, we have completed the, uh, I can't completed the chain code um, and we've completed the front end. We are trying to tie it together. Uh, last couple of meetings, there have been some challenges to get everyone, um, you know, together. So hopefully, we are we are gaining back the momentum. And I'm hoping, you know, by next meeting, we will have something. Uh, if we if we are done with the integration, I think we will be ready for, you know, full fledged demo wherein you know the the users can sign up and then they can. You know, the payer as a payer, as a member, as a you know pharmacy, and 
see the transaction, which includes the consent management and all. Uh, so that's something that is going on actively. I am looking for any support that anyone can provide in the group as well. Uh, you know, um, additional hands are always helpful <laughs> uh, with the with the stuff that we are doing. Uh, but I'm I'm really hopeful in another couple of weeks we will be at a point wherein uh, it will be done end to end to be consumed not just by you know someone who understands blockchain but someone as an end user also. So that's where we are right now. Ravish, and what's the best way someone can contact you to to see if they can help or refer to you? Uh, what's your email? What's the best way to contact? Yeah, if just, you could, just, can you put that in the chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will put that in the chat. And uh, if you go to the pair subgroup, there is a directory. You can get in touch with me as well. But I will definitely put that in the chat, how to get in touch with me. Um, I know um, Erica wanted to, you know, get engaged with the, with the discussions because it's closer to her expertise as well. Um, so we are just trying to get back in momentum um, on that and you know any anyone who who can contribute both from you know pharmacy process perspective or payer process perspective or even a member perspective that would be great thank you very much as always and um all right we'll go back into the thing i was talking about earlier but i do want to mention of another uh another link that i thought was um uh leah reach out to varish um so there was a, a report that came out in the state of California that tied in blockchain digital identity for vulnerable populations. This one hits home to me as uh, I'm based in Philadelphia, PA in the United States. And unfortunately we have a lot of people that would be considered as part of a vulnerable population, either in homeless, uh, you know, categorized homeless or, or not having the financial means to get by. Uh, the state of California actually created a framework that you could be able to uh, create a digital identity and have uh, people access different way, um, resources for funding uh, over time. And I, I thought this overview was fantastic. So I'm gonna put this in the chat as well. I'm also gonna uh, put this in the agenda too, overall. Um, uh, for one, there is a project out of the city of Austin that we may have all heard of uh, that's called Austin MyPass, which is also creating a digital identity verified by blockchain to uh, give uh, financial resources, whether in cryptocurrency or digital payments uh, to the homeless to be able to receive meals and to be able to receive aid. Uh, I'm very passionate about those projects and I want to be able to um, to really get the ball moving on some of those things. The state of California interviewed some folks from Consensus Health like Sean Mannion and Dr. Jonathan Holt who usually joins our calls here. Um, but they also interviewed a ton of folks that were actually part of not just academia, but were part of the state of California as well. If I can go all the way to the bottom of that. Highly interesting read. I think you all should take a look at it. And I'm sorry to give everyone homework, but, <laughs> but I thought it was actually really interesting stuff to read. Darn it, this thing takes so long to get to. Anyway, check out that link. Uh, I'm gonna add it into the notes here for everyone to have as well. Um, so yeah, this, uh, that's all the, the stuff I wanted to talk about. Any other questions or, or comments from the discussion we were having earlier? Because now it's just open forum and, and anyone could bring up anything of relevance. Does anyone have any their events, newsworthy items, things they want to discuss to us? Mike, since um, it's open forum, I just wanted to put a request. Uh, one is the, um, you know, um, if possible, maybe next meeting or the following meeting, I would love to give an overview of the solution that we are, we have worked on. And second is I have another, um, um, you know, folks that I have been talking to, um, they have built, built a immunization record system for travel um, on blockchain. Um, it's called a Muni. Um, I was wondering if we can schedule them for a presentation here. Um, I, I think they have they have uh, done a good job in what they have put together, um, and it might be worthwhile to share that information here. You know what they have done and and the solution that they have built. They are they are focusing on, you know, um, capturing the immunization record like yellow fever, and now you know with this pandemic, COVID nineteen vaccine when it comes through. So um, um, I will I will send out an email. Um, with the details, if you can let me know which 
you know, meeting, we can schedule them for a quick presentation. That would be very helpful. And I think it'll help, you know, all of us to learn more about uh, what they've done. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I guess P is very involved with the, uh, the My Past project. So uh, thank you very much for sharing this. I'm going to try and attend one of your meetups coming up. So uh, that is awesome. Right. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we're still holding our meetups every month. We've uh, moved them earlier in the day because we find evening meetups. People are pretty much burnt out. Um, but actually, this this one coming up in November, Adam, who's been the the guy running the My Past projects, is going to present and kind of tell everyone the status of it and talk about how they've you know approached certain areas like authentication and crypto key management and stuff. So it should be really good. Not not going to be super technical, but it should be very informative. That's awesome. So so one Ravish. Um just to hit all these items. Ravish, we will have you present the next Hyperledger Special Interest Group General Meeting, which will be two Wednesdays from now at 10 a.m. if that if that's possible for your schedule. Uh, and then, uh, as well as we could have a Muni after Thanksgiving in the United States, uh, which it could be the second week or first week of December. I think that could be a good time to, to add in that one. And then uh, Pete, I would love to have uh, you or people that are involved with my past, as you just mentioned, for sometime in December or January. I think these are all very relevant conversation pointers that we can just schedule up. Uh, we have some speakers that are on board for us, but um, but we could always mix and match and, and, and kind of organize them out a little bit better. But this is great stuff. I think uh, I'm a huge fan of this my past project. So. And I'm sure you're probably aware of this California document or maybe right. you were interviewed on it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can certainly put you in touch with uh, Adam, who's, who's the man to talk to about my past so, and uh, see whether he's available to come and chat more. Um, yeah, these are the people. Oh, so there's Adam Wideman. Oh, awesome. Cool. Yeah, we'd love to have Adam and, and or Dan, you know, whoever's part of that team. Love to have them present. I think it's, it's really cool because I think there's a, a bigger problem of uh, being able to get from Web 2 to Web 3 authentication credentials. So what I mean by that is typically today when we sign into systems and applications, uh, we use a username and a password. And then sometimes we lose that password or we lose, you know, potential private keys, et cetera. But how you can make it seamless for where I could use my web two credentials and then connect into web three systems. That is the biggest uh, burden that, that we at consensus help are trying to solve. And I'm sure many others are trying to do it as well. But, um, but yeah, that's a, that's, that's definitely um, something I think could be, useful for the city of Austin, my past, and, and many other uh, solutions that are connecting into blockchain technology. And, uh, and yeah, I'm also glad to see my buddy Anjum on here too, as part of that as well. So, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, all right. Awesome, thanks Pete for that. Uh, if you could, my email, I'll just put my work email in here for you, Pete. If you could email me separately about that, um, so I don't forget it. My email is kind of like my calendar and I reference back to it all the time. Uh, okay. let me know about that so I could be able to uh, talk to you more about getting the MyPass people on at some point in December. And, and Ravish, email me. You have my email. You have my email. But email me a, a Muni and all those details. Also, I, you can I find an Muni link. Put it in the chat here so um, we can add yep. to the group. Yep. I will get back to you and uh, let me find the link while we are here. Exactly. Anything else from others of the group? Any other details, co questions, comments, concerns? This is a pretty active format compared to some of the two previous ones we've had. So I'm glad that we get more people involved. <laughs> and uh, I hope everyone can refer others to join this group as well. I don't want to just make it like a, um, you know, a general podcast, and I don't want to make it an introductory sessions either. I want everyone to be mentally stimulated and, and 
and feel they learned something or, or made a new connection today. So uh, please uh, continually drive, uh, come to these meetings and, and bring others as well. Uh, you know, the more collaboration, more people, the better, and the more we could actually show the value adds of blockchain for healthcare and life science. So Mark, anything else, any add, other? Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment. Um, I was just gonna say, it's great to hear all the work that's happening in the US. Things are pretty slow over here in Europe. So it's great to actually leverage off this group and to hear the things that have done, been do, being done in this space, because I think we really need to, I, I'm trying to advocate and push things forward here as well. And so uh, this is a great group to, to participate in. So I'm gonna to try to rally up a few more troops to, to participate on this end of the world. Yeah. Great, so thank you. Also, would anyone let me know if um, if we can get more, you know, outside the U.S. type of participants' projects? Because obviously, I focus a lot in North Americas, but I'd love to get, you know, Guillermo. If if, if you could also, you know, connect me with people down south a little bit more and and everything, I'd love to make this more not just U.S. centric. And Marta too. Marta's based in the U.K., so she, she probably has a great idea of people to connect with as well. I'm I'm looking to get uh, folks from Pharma Ledger on at some point in January to give a presentation, especially Daniel Fritz, who's part of Novartis, uh, looking to get him to present and, and give some details on that project. But um, from others, yeah, definitely want more worldly uh, viewpoint. All right, well, um, if that's it, thank you everyone for, for joining today. Uh, I hope this was a beneficial session and uh, and we'll see you in two weeks. Uh, excited to, to keep some of the progress going. Ravish, you need to send us a link on Immuni. <laughs> no, I'm trying to find out <laughs> in my emails. <laughs> Give me one it's more okay. minute. <laughs> and by, uh, I, I, I'll, otherwise, I'll send it to you and you can distribute it, Mike. Um, that course. might be a better idea. Of course. Um, uh, also, oh, Ravish, Leah wants you to send your email so she can be able yeah. to reach out to you. And uh, I, I, Alicia also, I'm going to try and send all these links in an email, or I might just even put it on the general meeting notes and just add them as links as well, so you, everyone can refer back to it. But if you're part of the email list of the Healthcare Hyperledger uh, Special Interest Group, you'll be able to see these updates too. And Erica has great notes for us too, because she is amazing and helping us out with it too. She is our vice chair here, obviously. So. And I think I've been, uh, I think I sent my email ID as well. Looks like I have sent it to you accidentally then to everyone else. So I just posted that again. And um, Leah and, and Eric, I've been messaging you, but looks like the message, I mean, to your, your questions and those messages are going to Mike. <laughs> so um, uh, just if, 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 uh, um, Erica, I'll reach out to you if you can shoot me a quick email. I just sent, shared my email. If you can share your, um, you know, email with me, at least I can send you some questions that we need help with. Um, and Leah, you have my email now, so you should be able to get in touch with me. And just FYI, our uh, pair subgroup meetings are every other Fridays, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are trying to reschedule that for a better time so that you know, some of the other part of the world can join. Um, so I'm targeting earlier in the day, um, probably around 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or something like that, Eastern time. So it can be, uh, you know, it's easy for everyone to join or maybe 10 a.m. Eastern time. So it's everyone, it's easy for everyone to join. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, I also want to, I guess, give a plug for, there's a conference called Blockchain uh, Revolution global uh if anyone wants to join that i have to be part of a virtual booth from now until one o'clock so if anyone wants to come hang out and talk blockchain healthcare with me on this virtual booth which i've never done before uh please feel free to join actually i think you have to be registered the event anyway so it's probably useless to, to plug but uh <laughs> but yeah that's something i have to do for the next two hours all right um I will send out these notes soon. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, have a good rest of your week. Let's, uh, let's make it relevant. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.